Okay, so I will try to explain to you what Truebit is all about, um, why we need it, and uh, what can be used for. Um, to start, uh, I would like to talk about the topic of, of scalability. This is a chart of uh, Bitcoin transactions per day. And it starts in January 2009, and this is basically now. It's a, a linear scale, and you can already see that, yes, so um, it's growing. <laughs> Perhaps not so much uh, in the last months, but yeah. And uh, a similar chart for Ethereum. This is, yeah, transactions per day also, starting in uh, July, August 2015, uh, until now. <coughs> and I would also say it's kind of growing. And um, yes, yeah, so the, the question is, um, yeah. So we, most of you might have heard that blockchains do not scale currently, and this is one of the main uh, debates in the Bitcoin community. But what does it mean? What does to scale mean? Um, to put it simply, something scales if it performs equally well as it grows, and. Currently for Bitcoin, uh, there is empiric evidence that this is not the case because it's, so it, it gained more and more popularity over time and now it's harder and harder uh, to get transactions accepted and they also get more expensive. And of course, this problem exists in exactly the same way for Ethereum, perhaps even uh, worse since transactions can be more complicated. But currently Ethereum did not hit uh, this, this limit yet. Um, and what is the reason that uh, blockchains don't scale? The, the simple answer to that is that every <coughs> full node has to process every single transaction, or verify every single transaction. And of course, this does not really work well because you have a so you have the, the fixed block time, the time between two blocks. And in, in, in this time, if the system grows, which means it has more and more transactions, then uh, every node would have to process more and more transactions in the same time interval. Um, in scalable, scalable database systems, for example, you have the property that uh, if, if the, the usage increases of something, of that database system, then you can just add more servers and it will balance that out. So if you add more nodes, then uh, you can uh, cope with, with higher demand. And that is not possible with blockchains because of this property that every full node has to process every single block. And uh, of course we have this property uh, because of trust. Um, if, if, we, if we distribute uh, transactions just across some nodes, then uh, those nodes might be able to cheat because yeah, not all other nodes verify the transactions. And so, as I already said, scalability is also exactly the same problem in Ethereum. And uh, the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin is that uh, we were very well aware of that from the very start. Um, which does not mean that we knew the solution for the very start or that we had some way to, to already uh, yeah, prepare for scalability, but we at least knew that we will have to do at least one art fork uh, to, to cope with the scalability problem. Um, and there are at least uh, three <coughs> proposals how to yeah, scale the Ethereum blockchain. And the first one is the, the Casper research program. 
So Casper is not just about proof of stake, but also about uh, trying to scale the blockchain. And uh, the idea in Casper is that you use uh, yeah, a concept called sharding. That's more or less the same concept that is used, also used for these uh, scalable distributed databases. Uh, the idea is that yeah, you, you just send transactions to just certain nodes for verifying, but uh, Casper makes it secure again by rotating these uh, verifiers in regular intervals. Um, then there is uh, Raiden, which is the Ethereum analogy of the Lightning Network, which is yeah, the, the Bitcoin Lightning Network. And there the idea is that you can scale transactions by grouping them in a certain way. You, you move them off chain, so you don't process them in the blockchain, but you process them in a, a different network. And then at the end, uh, you group them, you group multiple transactions into a single transaction and just put that transaction on the blockchain in very, very uh, simple words. So you can get more, trans you can get more yeah, transactions in quotes into a single actual transaction on the blockchain, that, that's how it scales. Um, and uh, Truebit is the third way. And there the idea is to yeah, scale computations. I will explain a bit more later how, what that actually means. And uh, the way to scale it is using interactive verification that we will also go into detail later on that. Um, yeah, and also a nice thing to note is that only, only Casper requires an actual fork because the other two ways to scale can be directly implemented on the smart contract mechanism. Okay, um, why do we need to scale computation? Um, so, yeah, Ethereum has smart contracts, which means computations running on the blockchain, but they are limited in, in complexity, limited in resource usage, uh, because of the fact that every full node has, trans, has to process every transaction. And uh, with Truebit, you can get smart contracts which do not have a gas limit, essentially. They can be written in any programming language. Um, the reason behind that is, so if you don't have a gas limit, you can just uh, take a program written in Python and then just put the Python interpreter on the blockchain and uh, run the Python program through that. Uh, Ethereum smart contracts can be driven by neural networks so that we can have artificial intelligence on the blockchain. And you can even have file system access in smart contracts, which means you, you have a smart contract then it, it, and it accesses at a terabytes big file and reads a single chunk in there or even uh, computes a big sum over all the entries in this, this uh, gigantic file. Of course, these smart contracts will not run directly on the blockchain. We know it doesn't scale. But the, uh, the trust promise will be the same as if they would run on the blockchain. Uh, so this was a bit abstract. Uh, some more uh, specific practical examples. Uh, with Truebit, you can link multiple blockchains. So there's this Dogecoin Ethereum bridge project which uh, tries to create a bridge not only from Dogecoin to Ethereum, but also from Ethereum to Dogecoin. And the idea is that you can, you take, you can take Doge, Dogecoin and move it to the Ethereum blockchain where it will be a, a, an independent token. You can move it around as a token there and then also move it back, destroying the token and uh, yeah, releasing or generating new, new Doge on Dogecoin. Um, for that, you basically need a light client for the other network in the... So for one network in the other network and the, the light client for Dogecoin running on Ethereum will... yeah. As, as I said, so if you don't have a, a gas limit, you can just implement anything and verify the full uh, Dogecoin blockchain on Ethereum. Um, 
Another project is, uh, so Golem. Golem is a project to um, yeah, pay for other people to do your computations. And uh, their white paper mentions Truebit to actually verify that these computations were done correctly. And another example is LivePeer. They, are, they want to uh, create a video streaming platform where people are paid to encode the videos and they want to use Truebit to verify that the encoding was done correctly. <coughs> okay, uh, another very nice property of Truebit I want to mention is that it has so-called unanimous consensus. Um, this means that, okay, perhaps I should first explain the general framework. So uh, Truebit works in a way where you have a computation task, you have a program to run, Someone runs the program off-chain and uh, puts the result on the <coughs> And then people can rerun the same computation and check that it was done correctly if they want. And the idea, uh, and so this is similar to a blockchain where you have multiple miners who process all transactions and then verify each other. And uh, on a blockchain, if you have a disagreement there, then you get a fork. And uh, if you can convince over 50% of the hash power that your version is the correct one, then you basically convince the whole network. It's not exactly like that, but roughly. And for Truebit, it's different because you have to convince every single person. So uh, as long as there is a so as long as there is a single honest person who checks the, the computation and posts on the blockchain that he or she disagrees and the person is actually right, then uh, this, this, uh, it will not go through. So the, the person will get the, the result. Yeah? So basically the, there's only one transaction per uh, questionable uh, ex execution. Basically, not on every computation I have to submit a transaction to the song. But only if there's one question and I want to debate it, basically. Um, I didn't understand the question, sorry. <coughs> I run a transaction and um, I'm saying that it was done wrong, someone was cheating, then I submit a transaction. But I don't submit a transaction if everything runs fine and everybody agrees. Okay. Yes. Yes. So only in the case of actually cheating. Yeah. Okay. And another question? You, you probably get this, how is that done? Is that through sampling or how is that? We'll get to that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, so some of you have been here in an earlier talk about the same topic and uh, this, this first line was already in the, the first talk, but the second line is actually new. So uh, some months ago, we, we said, okay, a single, or, a single honest verifier suffices uh, so that nobody can cheat. But uh, it turned out that this single honest verifier is not always there. But uh, yeah, we added an economic uh, incentive mechanism to actually ensure that this single honest person is, is also always there. Um, and so there are other projects which do similar things uh, like Golden, MyExec, and Solemn. But uh, the difference to those projects is that they focus mainly on uh, performing the computations or outsourcing the computations, but not uh, on the fact that they are done correctly. And Truebit, on the other hand, is yeah, is, is focusing mainly on, uh, on correctness and uh, not on yeah, reducing the costs or, or something like that. So Truebit is really about scaling up uh, what can be done inside a single transaction, if you know. Yeah. So if you don't have gas limit, how do you uh, solve the halting problem? I don't know what a program. Okay, the, then, uh, so, it's Ethereum smart contracts, but with an extremely, with a very much higher gas limit. Oh, you're right. 
So Truman has some concept of gas, but it's much more relaxed than if, if you want. Okay. Um, so, yes. Uh, this was the non-technical part. <laughs> Just to scare everyone here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I hope it's still it was, it's, it's still all the understandable. Um, so how do we do that? Um, yeah, as we already said, the main problem why we cannot scan computation is because everyone has to compute everything. So the solution is obviously uh, build a system where not everyone has to compute everything. So I have a computational task posted on the blockchain, and two or three people take it on and perform the computation, and then post the result on the blockchain and uh, the main point here is not, we just take the, the majority answer, but the main point is if, if we have any disagreement here, then these people go to court, and court here means blockchain, so we have the, the smart contract judge, which, uh, who finds out uh, without error who gave the wrong answer. And yeah, again, the, the simple solution here would be that the smart contract just reruns the full computation, but that, again, doesn't scale. So the, the checking who was in error has to be magnitudes faster than actually running the computation. Okay, and how do we do that? We use a concept called the verification game. Um, so, and the, the key uh, term is, uh, here is not sampling, but binary search, and we'll see how that works <laughs> uh, yeah. in a minute. Um, so, a computation in a uh, same computation model always consists of some kind of steps. So we have a computation which starts at step one and ends at step one million. And every single step is quite small, easy to follow. Um, and we have a proposer with, a, with an input, a challenger with the same input, but at the end uh, they come up with two different outputs. That's their, their disagreement. And um, what they do is they rerun the whole computation uh, while taking a snapshot of memory at every single step, computing a Merkle tree of that snapshot, and storing the Merkle root. They do not submit the Merkle root, they do not submit all the Merkle roots to the blockchain right away, but they store it. And uh, this means, yeah, their, their Merkle root at the beginning will be the same because they started in the same, uh, in, in, a, in a very fixed setting, and it will be different in the end because their memory content, their output is different. And uh, then the smart contract, the judge, will come and say, uh, we'll take the, the middle, the step in the, in the middle here, and ask them for the, the local root of their state at that point in time, and they might give the same answer. This means, so this means that at some point here in the second half, there has to be a single step, at least one single step, uh, where we go from agreement to disagreement. So, both parties were in agreement here, but they are in, dis in a disagreement here. So, at some point uh, along the line here, they, has to, they have to move from agreement to disagreement. And that's just the point which we use, uh, we search using binary, uh, we try to find using binary search. So, the smart contract uh, asks for the, the center position here, and the parties again reply here, they give a different reply. So we continue the search in this area. Uh, this goes on and on. And at some point, uh, because the, the size of this uh, time interval always halves, at some point we, re we will reach a situation where we have one step where both parties are in agreement, and the next step where the parties are in disagreement. And the good thing about that is that a smart contract can, so a smart contract can just take, start with the, the situation here in this step, and just recompute a single step and check which is the correct result. Because uh, yeah, a single step is is easy to compute. We have we have 
some computational power on the blockchain, but it's very limited, and uh, yeah, a single step easily fits in this, in this limit. Okay, uh, so uh, this takes 20 rounds, which is quite long, I would say. I mean, it's still uh, tiny uh, compared to 1 million steps. That's what I said. It has to be magnitudes faster on chain than actually running the full computation. But still, um, yeah, the good news is that these 20 rounds can be further reduced. And furthermore, the cheater is found with certainty. There's, there's, no, there's yeah, no way to, to get around that. And, uh, but because of that, if you, if you try to cheat, you already know you will lose in that game if someone watches. Then uh, why would you want to play the game? So why would you want to cheat? So as long as you know that someone watches, you will probably not cheat, which means that this verification game is actually never played. But it has to be there and it has to be in code and correct uh, for this whole mechanism, mechanism to work. Yeah, so, uh, so if there is someone who watches, then the verification game will not be played, but still everything works out. And but the, the problem is, um, so everything works, works perfectly, all people, uh, n nobody cheats, everything works fine, there's one honest verifier who verifies everything, and, but, so, the, the, how the game works is that, of course, this is all deposit-based, so all participants put a deposit on, on chain, and if they are guilty of cheating, then their deposit is destroyed, and the people who discover that fact, they get a reward. So the verifier will get a reward if they, if they find an error. But if everything works, works fine, then uh, yeah, they never find an error, so they will never get a reward. And this is actually a very fundamental problem, because how do you, as a verifier, how do you prove to a system that you check the computation? You can, you can, at the end you can say, oh yes, yeah, seven, that's, that's also the result I got, but yeah, I mean, you knew the result beforehand, so how can you, yeah, you can just, just have copied that. So, um, yeah, over time the, the verifier will lose interest because they are not paid in any way, but have to do exactly the same work as the, the main problem solvers. So they will, uh, will stop looking and as soon as the solvers notice that no one is looking anymore, then they can cheat and the whole system breaks down. So uh, we need a way to uh, pay verifiers for their work. And uh, the solution to that is uh, something called forced errors. And the way it works is you basically inject an error into this whole process, which can then be detected by the verifiers, and then can, they can be paid for that. So, um, who pays them? Uh, the system. So, so it's just system. Huh? System. No, no, so, uh, okay, perhaps I should have uh, explained the whole setting a bit more. Uh, sorry about that. So, uh, if you want the TrueBit system to solve a task for you, you have to pay for that. So you have to pay, yeah, a, a, a fee. And this fee is in part paid out to the person who posts the solution to the task. And in part it is, it is saved in, a, uh, in an account we call jackpot. And if such a forced error occurs and a verifier finds the error, then the verifier is paid from that jackpot. And so, yeah, I mean, of course, it's a bit different. The solver uh, cannot be punished because the solver had to inject this forced error. It's a, it's a pseudo-random but deterministic process, and um, the solver cannot uh, kind of uh, yeah, choose to include or not include it. Okay, um, is that clear how that works? It's so genius. Wait for it. <laughs> no, because... Um, yeah, it has it has flaws. <laughs> what do you yes. must, what do you must you know run uh, So true randomness does not exist on the blockchain. That's why we need pseudo randomness, and it's kind of there are multiple factors that that go in 
and it's just a a process that can be verified by a smart contract. So uh, the but is it exposed? In which way? I don't know. Yeah. So that who injects the error? Is it the um, the proposer so, himself? And so uh, the solver. So there's, there's the solver. Yeah. Yeah, so there's the proposer who gives the task, oh, then the yeah, solver who solves the tasks and puts the solution on the blockchain. Does the solver know that he has to include in uh... So it's some uh, deterministic function uh, taking into account, I think, the, uh, <coughs> the block hash and perhaps also the hash of the solution. So, so that, and the idea is that the solver knows that this just happened. Okay, let's, let's perhaps skip to the next slide where uh, we'll find another problem. Um, so the solver knows that this happened. That, so the solver is forced to inject a forced error and this condition is also verifiable by smart contracts on chain. And if, if the solver does not do uh, inject the error, then uh, uh, he or she will be punished. And the problem is now, so everyone who detects this error gets a reward. And now the solver can, of course, uh, notify verifiers about the fact that the error, that the forced error just happened. So the, in the ideal world, the solver injects the error, but does not tell anyone about that, because we want the verifiers to actually re-execute everything. So, right? So, okay, perhaps, um, yeah. Um, these forced errors, so the, the, the rewards for finding the forced errors are of course not for the forced errors. We pay the verifiers rewards at forced errors because that's where we can pay them. But the actual idea is that we want the verifiers to verify all other transactions too. It's just, so they, they have to verify everything because such a forced error might happen in every single uh, task. And you only know that it happened after the fact, basically. And so as a verifier, you have to uh, acquire that, that information that a forced error happened. And the way we want the verifier to acquire that information is by just re-executing the task. Okay? And there's a second way that the, they can acquire this information, and that's by asking the solver. Right? Because the solver knows that the error happened because they had to <coughs> inject the error. And uh, of course, on a on a smart contract blockchain, you have all sorts of uh, weird uh, bribery things which are possible. So it's yeah quite trivial to just add a mechanism where uh, solvers are paid by verifiers to tell them this, to, to give them this information. Um, yeah, and the question is, how do we? Yeah. So it's so if the verifier is on the pay out. Well, that is an error, but that can be verified that correct. Uh, Sorry, can you say that? The verifier is, is a payout, but he catches a, 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 a computation that, that has an error. Yes, but so this. That, but that one, if, if the computation, if the original computation is correct, the, the verifier verifies that the computation is correct. Yeah, you can't, as a verifier, there's no way to prove that you re ran the, the, yeah, the so, so the verifier only gets. The yes, error. so it's a, it happens at, at random, more or less regular intervals. Yeah, so, so the, 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 random, the random error is the way for the verifier to get payout. Yes, yes. Mining, it's like yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, oh, yeah. So, yeah. It can be compared to mining where you get a payout, yeah, not with every, single, with every block, but at, at certain points in time. Which then shifts the motivation more, which is really the question, mm -hmm. towards solving those injected errors. Mm -hmm. So people are then more motivated to check those actually, and it might decrease their motivation to other. Sure, so as, as a verifier, since you can only pay for forced errors, yeah. or for, for errors, uh, you want to only verify these tasks. But there's no way to find out whether it. So I mean, the only way to find out is, or there are two ways to find that out. And one is rewriting the computation, and the other is getting that information from the solver. 
Yeah. Wouldn't the other way around be to randomly pay people for checking um, the verifications, even though you can't prove if they really did it? So whoever, we don't care who actually runs the verification, as long as someone does. It's like a search dog, you have to uh, put in fake rewards to keep him interested. Yeah, but I, I, I just question whether it increases, I mean, like, it increases interest, but maybe for the wrong motivation. So you want, I just ask myself, it's also possible to increase the motivation for the things where you say you can't, you can't check when they really need um, you have to run everything to find the, uh, the rewards, the errors, force errors. Yeah. And it's, it's exactly the same thing you do, whether you yeah. just verify. Yeah, hmm? okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, how do you prevent the solver from telling the verifiers that a uh, solver? Yeah, okay. Maybe rather than choosing the verifier. <laughs> Sampling. Huh? So that would be kind of like a determine how much information you need to validate that this is a true outcome or a true computation. Yeah, I mean, so on a blockchain, you never know. On a blockchain, never. Nah. On a blockchain, nobody knows that you're a fringe. So you don't have a reputation system attached to the solvers, and yeah. It's difficult, and also, I mean, so we want this to be to be tight, also uh, against kind of arbitrary bribery smart contracts. Um, that's why just sampling the solvers uh, is not not the best solution, I think. Hmm? But you're randomly changing the what did you say? Randomly changing the solvers? Yeah, no, no. not not the solvers, they're fine. Basically, as the same. So something I perhaps didn't say clearly is that anyone can be a verifier, and also you can from out, you can you can step in as and challenging a, a computation from outside at any time. And you're not so. That's another model when you say uh, you have to verify the computation. But if you do that, then you have to punish people when they do not verify the computation. That's kind of a, a tricky thing to do. Okay, but that's what we come up with as a solution. But listen, one more question. So basically, every time I do a computation, I do have to uh, submit a request on the blockchain and do, and the solver has to submit the result. So that's basically for each computation, no matter how large it is, it's one, one two transactions. So this is meant for large computations, yes. Okay. And uh, the whole process takes multiple transactions, yes. Okay, so it's not scaling the amount of transactions and computation of transactions, it scales the, the size of the transactions. So, it's, it's, so it takes a constant amount of uh, transactions in a good case, yeah. where we don't have to run the verification game, but the, uh, the length of the computation uh, can be... Can it's be like we increased compared gigantic. to what we had earlier on the blockchain, but the thing is, I can't do more transactions, right? I can only do larger ones. If yes, so in, Trubit, do Trubit does not scale the number of transactions, it scales the, right. the amount of computation okay. of transactions. But it feels like with the minimum, right? we just put all transactions together. You could, probably. Well, yeah. Okay, uh, this is how you prevent the solver from sharing the information about the forced error with the verifiers. And so, so we don't prevent the solver from also challenging their own computation in case of forced error. That's a good thing. So it's just the solver just get another reward, uh, and we can factor that in uh, with the regular rewards. So that's fine. Um, but the idea is that. Uh, the, the reward will decrease dramatically uh, the more challenges there are. So um, these numbers can actually be improved, but that's how it, will, it is written in the white paper. So I will explain it like that. So if we only have one challenge, this, this is usually just the solver challenging, challenging uh, him, uh, him or herself. Uh, the solver 
we'll get a reward of, of 100. That's just some fixed number. And if there's another challenge, then the two challenges will both get 25, and in some 50. So if the solver shares that information with someone, the solver's reward will decrease from 100 to 25. So that's not something you want like to do. And also, uh, if you are a, a verifier and acquire that information by rerunning the computation yourself, you also don't want to share it. Because then, yeah, if, if only you and the solver, solver uh, found that out, then uh, your reward decreases from 25 to 8.3. So, yeah, that's the way how you can solve this, this information sharing problem. Okay. Well, this, is, this basically stands against whatever the computation is worth, right? So if the computation moves a lot of money, it might be, or like could potentially move a lot so, of money. So of course, so uh, yeah, there's an, this all runs on a blockchain, and even the, the blockchain has an upper limit of uh, how much, uh, what do you want to do on the blockchain, with, with, what, which value is attached to what you do. So. If you, if you put something on a blockchain which is worth more than uh, the whole blockchain, then an attacker can just attack before the blockchain and uh, get this thing somehow. Yeah. And two questions. First, um, the first one is not really, um, so it's connected, but, but it is not a problem for, for, this, um, for, for the solution, but it's another attack. Um, can I, I ask them, uh, Verifier not simply wait until someone challenges and then only run this particular computation because I'm quite sure that there's a problem in this particular computation and then get all the people rewards without verifying other. Yes, very good question. Yeah. Um, that's especially relevant for the solver because the solver immediately knows there's a forced error, so you could just watch if the solver challenges or not. Right. And because of that, uh, you have to randomly make something called fake challenges. So it has to be some commit reveal mechanism where you first post something to the, uh, to the blockchain which looks like a challenge, but then in the end it turns out it's not a challenge. Okay. And then, um, so that solves that, but there's uh, another problem which I see. Um, for example, let's say some random numbers. If you have uh, like a uh, false error every 10 computations or whatever, and each computation um, requires Quite a lot of work for the um, for the solver, and so what he really would like to do to do is just post fake results, and he earns a lot of money because he doesn't have to have his computing cluster run or so whatever. And so what he what he could still do would say, okay, I, I just um, um, share this information anyways, and I for these false errors I don't get any money because you know I share the information and everyone can challenge and so on. So. Uh, I don't get any money for the post errors, but I um, save all this money for the for the other transactions where I don't have to, to run my computing cluster. And because I always share the information about the post error, no one will ever um, look at my other complications because they know if I didn't share information about the post error, there won't be an error. So no one will challenge any of my other complications. <coughs> and I'm like, so if there's a mismatch between Money so that, you can earn on the false errors and money you can save by not having to run the other computations. The, so this is the reward the verifiers get. For, so if you do it every 10 uh, tasks, we were more thinking about every 100 tasks. But, so this is the only reward the verifiers get for verifying all the transactions, all the tasks, uh, until the last false error. And the amount of work they put in is the same amount of work that the solver puts in. So this, this so the, the amount that is paid out here is extremely large. So it's, it's comparable to the sum of all the uh, computation <coughs> fees uh, paid for the tasks until the last uh, process. Okay. You, you're talking about running arbitrary code, right? Like running some light client, um, or maybe running some Eiffel software or something, some crazy thing. And um, but then at the same time, you're talking. You gave a couple of examples where you had, there was the need for on-chain computation for injecting the error, as well as for the the, the computation of the last step between the, the right result, the wrong result, and the workload. And 
So, but wouldn't that require that the on-chain computation has to be running like Eiffel code or Python code or something? Uh, so, we're planning to implement this single step verification for a process uh, for an architecture called Lanai, which is developed by Google for some networking processor. And this architecture is, is quite simple. And Google wrote a, an LLVM backend for that architecture. So you can compile C, C++, and Rust code into that, uh, into that backend. And I'm not sure what Eiffel is written. Eiffel is, a, Eiffel is a language from the 90s. I just speak arbitrary rather than Yeah, but so yeah, anything you can, where you have, so if you have a, uh, yeah, if you have something that runs on LLVM, then you can do it. And even if you have an interpreter written in C or C++, then you can also do it. And how about um, having access to things like I have access to solidity, like block number and block hash and, and uh, value? Like, I don't have to do these kind of computations, right? Yeah, I mean, it's not part of a block, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, it's just so also this this binary search that only works for for pure functions so you have to uh, include the full state in input and output so you can work on on swarm files as i said but that requires that you actually uh, have a proof that the file is available which is possible in swarm at least in the, in the final version and that's why you can so you can you basically put the, the, the hash of the swarm file as an input, and then you can read it during the process. So I also I don't have any state, and I cannot do any value transfer. So if you want to use state, it has to be part of the input. Mm -hmm. But it's fine, I mean, you, yeah. So you can take the, the whole blockchain as input and run a single uh, block on that. Yeah. Are there always multiple solvers for every uh, for every computation, or is one solver sufficient? So, yeah, this is something that we still have to work out in, in experiments. But it's yeah, it depends on the reliability. Um, but perhaps one or two. Is there a strategy to? Um, to wait what another solver, a competing solver, uh, gets us a result and resubmitting the same result is that a possible strategy to cheat the system. Um, okay, sorry, no, yeah. It only works with, so this, this model we're currently trying to be, it only works if there's one, one solver. So you, you post a task and then the solver commits to the task, runs the task and posts the solution. And the others are verifiers, basically, but do the same, same job. Um, how if, if one, uh, you said that um, the challenge, oh no, when the, you, you said that um, the two, there are two solutions, and then there's this binary search going on, comparing the two solutions. How, um, how is this done when there's only one solver and one solution? And if there's, a, there's a solver and a verifier who are in disagreement. Oh. That's what it is. Back there with a question or? Yeah, when did you release the white paper explaining this? Sorry, what? When did you release the white paper? Did, uh, two weeks ago, I guess. Or right, that's why I have uh, it. It's a technical white paper, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be better if you just read the white paper and then ask you this question. But uh, another attack that I, um, I would come up with, and so, um, in principle, uh, you would have a situation where then there would be a solver and there would al always be verifiers. You know, that's what we want. And so, um, in the end, it is, um, every time there's a false error, there won't be the only one challenge because the solver will, will challenge and, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six verifiers will, will um, challenge. And, and at some point, you will uh, reach an equilibrium because if, if there are too many verifiers, no, they won't earn anything. And if there are but if this number decreases, then they want the earnings increase until there's some kind of equilibrium. And let's say this equilibrium is the, uh, the solvers plus three verifiers. Just, just you know, for argument's sake. 
Wouldn't it then make sense for the solver to just create four accounts and always um, submit four challenges, uh, uh, his, his challenge and three other challenges? So everyone looking at that sees, ah, there are already enough verifiers. It doesn't make sense for me to join in. And then same problem as before? Yeah, that's, that's called the scary of verifiers attack. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, Yeah, there, there is a solution to that, uh, and the idea is that you always have multiple parallel uh, tasks, and verifiers choose randomly between these tasks. So it's, it, it's a bit difficult, but it's explained in the white paper. Yeah? Uh, by the way, I really like this, it's really cool. Uh, what is the roadmap overall? Where is <laughs> no, that's not the roadmap. <laughs> so, um, yes, we don't have a, a full roadmap yet, but we're actually planning on implementing that, and we're looking for, for both funding and developers to do that. Uh, the, yeah, the exact specifics are not clear yet, um, but, yeah. Um, yeah, to wrap up, so, yeah, I explained how TrueBit scales trusted computation with unanimous consensus. So, and the, the only requirement is a, a working trusted execution environment with limited capacity, so in blockchain. And it can be scaled to more or less unlimited capacity and with unanimous consensus. Uh, the website is TrueBit.io, and the technical white paper has a complicated link, which can also be found on the website. Okay, thank you. Right. For, I'll ask one more question. Okay, I'll, um, in terms of scalability, like, is that an either-or scenario, or can you have this, like, TrueBit, it run simultaneously as the other proposed solutions? Yeah, it's. I mean, it doesn't require hard fork. It's just another smart contract on Ethereum. Okay. And it, it also so the whole system does not require Ethereum uh, specifically, but just some smart contract uh, blockchain system, some trusted uh, execution environment. Okay, then.